Hi, I'm Dr. Brannick Riggs, Vice President of Education at doTERRA International. I'm here with our Scientific and Medical Education Committee here in Europe to have a discussion about the wellness chart. The wellness chart was created by Dr. David Hill, one of our founders, 15 years ago now. And he really had this foundation of lifestyle and then, of course, some things we can do for our health on top of that. It begins with nutrition and digestion. And on that, it builds movement and metabolism. We know that nutrition is that foundational piece and that once we have that under control, we can really move on to metabolism and how much we're moving every day. On top of that, we then move to rest and manage stress, realizing that stress is so important to help control in our lives and we must be getting good rest. On top of that, we try to reduce our synthetic exposure, trying to make sure that we're getting rid of those things in our lives that can be causing issues for us um, from a synthetic standpoint. Moving up from there, we move past lifestyle, now moving into more informed self-care and then proactive health care. And so we want to have this foundational level conversation about nutrition and digestion. So Ruth, what do you feel are the fundamentals that people need to know about this level? Of yeah, well, I, first of all, I, I love that they've put this at the basis of it. I like, I like the whole idea of the chart and how it sort of builds up on it. And it is really important for us to recognize that the foods that we eat are the fundamental tools that we have to make our bodies work and function. It's how we deal with, first of all, you need the macronutrients, you know, the proteins, the carbohydrates, the fats for the building blocks and for energy. But you also need all the micronutrients that help your body to defend itself against what's coming against it, to keep your immune system healthy. So yeah. all the things that you need come from the food that you eat yeah. and the way that you eat it and the balance that you have. Those cells need those micronutrients, right? Absolutely. They don't function very well without the micronutrients. Yeah, exactly right, yeah. They call them vital amines. <laughs> Vitamins, right. vital amines. Yeah. Right, yeah. So we, we, we absolutely need them. Right? And, and unfortunately, we're getting less and less of those in our food. Right? That's right. Yeah. Things have changed significantly over the last you know, 10,000 yeah, years. It's one of the things that actually really surprised me um, was, I'd always heard this about nutritional deficiencies, but then when you stop and think about it, and you think about intensive farming methods that we use, um, the things that we put on the plants in order to sort of encourage them to look nice in the shop, but they right. somehow don't taste as good and that means that they haven't got the same nutrients in there. Yeah. We know that happens. We know we've reduced the nutrient qualities of our foods yeah. for years. Depletion in soil quality. Right, right. No. Turns out phytonutrients don't typically taste good. No. And so so we, we get rid of a lot of those phytonutrients, right, just so that people will buy the product. An yeah. apple, you know, 500 years ago was small and bitter and, and sour and People would eat them, but did not enjoy them. Now they're full of sugars, mm -hmm. natural sugars, but they're full of sugars and they're really large, right? So we've changed that over a period of time. You mentioned earlier, we were having a conversation yeah. about vitamin D and the yeah. challenge that a lot of, that's a, that's a challenge here in Europe of keeping a vitamin D level to a, 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 good, a good level. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's like an epitome of a lack of vitamin D. Mm -hmm. So uh, people have, their own clothes that are not exposed to, to, to the sun. They cannot have all the process to production of vitamin D and they have really a lack of vitamin D. So there are some studies that says that more than 95% of people has any type of deficiency of vitamin D. So actually mm -hmm. there, it's concerning. Mm -hmm. So about the, the, all the, the need that vitamin D is in our body and the bone development and all the consciousness that will, will come. Yeah, we, we know the immune system uses vitamin D as a, as a fuel, and when we, we don't have enough vitamin D, it becomes a challenge. Our immune system doesn't function nearly as optimally, and we wanna keep, you know, we wanna make sure that that's an issue. We, especially those that live in the northern countries, the, where it gets cold, right? And then during the wintertime, we may see the sun on occasion, but we're covered up, right? We, we put mittens on, we put hats on, we put coats on, and we're completely covered up. So the skin actually gets no exposure for yeah. sometimes six, six, seven months, yeah. Yeah. and therefore Na we don't make much We're joking that, that maybe if you have more than 200, 200 uh, days in a bikini, we will have like a, like a good amount of <laughs> right. vitamin D, but right. it's not possible right. nowadays. I don't even have one day in that. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> there are some good sides to it, that's right. true. Right. Yeah, but oh. it's ne never enough. It's, it's not enough. For, yeah. So I, I see my practice every day, 
when I ask for blood uh, exams, mm -hmm. the lack of vitamin D. Yeah, yeah. And I need to thoroughly supplement that. So it's actually a concern. Right, becomes a challenge. Yeah. And, and I think because of that, I would say that we, everyone really does need some supplementation of vitamins and minerals. Yeah, right? as long as it's the right type of supplementation. I mean, we all know what those you know, supermarket shelves look like with stacks and stacks and <laughs> right. stacks of stuff up there of very different prices. And it's not, yeah. a, lot of the, a lot of the vitamins aren't necessarily available. Right. When, you know, when you just put them in a pill and give them to you, they, they might not be absorbed properly by the body. So there's, you know, there, it is a complex process. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's like easy to sell, but at the end, is not the, the most profitable for the body. Right. And how they, those vitamins are made, that's a concern too. Yeah, yeah. And, and we need that full spectrum of vitamins, right? We don't just have that one laboratory created vitamin. We get, Alex, you, you're kind of an expert on this, but we get our vitamins from food sources generally, and yeah. that's much better for us. Well, I think one of the unfortunate things about nutrition or or inadequate or deficiencies in nutrition is that we don't notice those deficiencies right away. Yeah. Right. Right. They build upon themselves over time and then it's too late, right? Then right. we're having challenges that are harder to correct for. So um, if we can have that base of the found, that foundational uh, strong nutrition, it's going to really help us out in the long run. Yeah, that's true. And you are what you eat and you are how you eat. Mm -hmm. So it's important to have a look what we eat, but it's also too important how we eat. I think in our time, we all eat too fast. Everything has to go mm -hmm. fast and quickly, and the body has no time to take all this nutrition we need on, because everything what we eat, the body try to take out everything what is important, bring it to your cells, mm -hmm. uh, make metabolism in it, and then that our body uh, works not only well, it, it, it has to work, super well mm -hmm. for our for a, for a good um, um, health span right. and um, if we eat too fast we have a second problem if we eat too fast we eat too much yeah. if we eat slowly with time um, with um, yeah maybe also um, not in hurry then um, we we ate not not so much because um, the body needs 20 to 30 minutes eating um, when the body said us okay it's enough so um, a lot of people have weight problems because they eat too fast yeah yeah I, i've heard it say that not just we are what we eat, but maybe more importantly, we are what we digest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because sometimes we're eating things <laughs> yeah. that we're not, we're not digesting well, and sometimes our GI tract is not really set up to be as healthy as it could be. So digestion becomes also a really important part of this nutrition and digestion. We've talked a bit about nutrition, so digestion now becomes a concept in which we need to talk about, so what are the factors that help us with healthy digestion? What helps yeah. supports the digestive and if you system? Think are we our physiology adapt to our way of life? Mm -hmm. Because we have now this running days and work and time for the kids and we don't have time to prepare the old foods and um, prepare good meals mm -hmm. and all this lifestyle that we have, all this rushing, yeah. maybe our physiology is not really adapted to our lifestyle yeah, right? because nowadays. Stress certainly affects digestion, yeah, right? Completely. Slows the GI tract. Yeah. And therefore we don't digest things as well. That's, so that's very true. And, and the microbiome. Love it. I was just yeah. gonna say that. So so <laughs> expound on topic. that for us, Ruth. Tell us about the microbiome and how that helps the GI tract in digestion. Well, I mean it's a balance of the, the all the microbes that we have mm -hmm. in the GI tract. We've we've found out in recent years, and it's relatively recent years that we recognize the importance that it is uh, both in digestion yeah. and the passage through the tract and how we digest things and how we absorb things. Mm -hmm. Some of the nutrients that we have actually need those commensal bacteria in order to be able to to be available to us. Right. Um, but it's also really closely linked to our immune system. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's a really fine balance. We need to have a good microbiome and it is easily upset by stress, by the food that mm -hmm. we eat, by the things that we do. Yeah. Um, so those are really important yeah. elements. To, and to it's think. connected to our blood sugar re regulation right. we uh, talked about yesterday. Yeah. Because if you eat um, some food, it could be that for some um, things like um, what, what, what normally is, we have the glycemic index. So if you have something like white bread, uh, the most of the people have a high glycemic index, so mm -hmm. a high rising uh, blood uh, 
um, a high uh, rising amount of, of, of uh, sugar in the blood. But um, if you have other food, like healthy food, green food, then it's uh, lower. But uh, we are individuals and our microbiome is also something what is influencing our blood sugar rising, our mm -hmm. roller coaster. So um, it could be that for some people maybe white bread isn't so bad than for other people. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also um, there is maybe someone who eat a carrot and have then a, a high rise of a blood sugar. So right. a microbiome is a big secret, it but is. it's totally individual, an individual composition in our body. Mm -hmm. yeah. I love that you said that, Alexander, because it's one of, one of my mantras. It's always you, knowing yourself is the most important thing. Everybody is different. Yeah. You know, we can give lots of advice and that there are loads and loads of different diets available. You know, mm -hmm. that you have the paleo diet and the vegan diet. They might work for some people, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. and, right. they, and there's a lot of science behind some of these, you know, mm -hmm. and how they can impact. At the end of the day, you need to know how your body responds to the food that you eat, you yeah. know, and, that's, and, what, and what works for you. And I think that's a really important element. And almost all of the things that we're going to be talking about is knowing your own individual person, and that might be the microbiome, it might be your, your other sensitivities that you have. Yeah, the microbiome is fascinating to me. I, I recently read an article that was stating that we actually are more bacterial cells than we are human cells, <laughs> which means that I, I may not identify maybe as a human anymore. I may identify <laughs> as a bacterial planet, I guess, that has this bacteria that, that I house. And so we need to make sure as we look at digestion and nutrition that we're being kind to the, the, the good bacteria. Yeah, good. Our, ho you know, our, our host, that we're, our bacteria that we're hosting in our system. So Alex, in, in a world where some people don't even think about exercise anymore, Tell us about the next layer of the chart, which is really movement and metabolism and, and how important that is and maybe why we build that on top of nutrition and digestion. Yeah, for better or for worse, um, technology's come a long way. And mm -hmm. it requires that we don't have to move as much as we might have had to historically. Yeah. And uh, you can travel easily around the world and basically just sit there the entire time. But but really, our bodies are not designed for such a sedentary lifestyle. Mm -hmm. we're, we're designed genetically, our cells, our muscles, our joints. We are, we are supposed to be moving mm -hmm. regularly. So um, we have a little bit of a, a tug of war with the, the comforts of today. Mm -hmm. But um, the good news is it doesn't take a whole lot of effort to see improvements. Yeah. Something as simple as... 10 to 30 minutes per day of simple activity can go a long way in improving your, your health and your wellness. So some simple things that people can do are you know, taking the stairs mm -hmm. instead of the elevator. Or mm -hmm. you know, maybe you park Just a, a little, car yeah. a little bit further away. <laughs> or even better yet, yes, don't even take the car. Right. You know, yeah. use, your, use your feet. It's amazing to me how long people will drive around a parking lot looking for the but closest yes. space. Yeah. Or, <laughs> as opposed drive, to just parking further away and walking into I, the I, store. I, I chuckle a little bit when you see people drive to the gym. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and then they get out to go exercise. Right. It's right. like, uh, this is yeah. a little If that gym ironic. is 30 miles away, maybe. But yeah. most yeah. of the time, the gym is a whole lot closer, right? Sure. And then <laughs> we're okay. But I think it, it's really interesting that you say that. I think a lot of people try, again, you know, those fads there are, those sort of idea that you have to do, it started with, you know, jogging and aerobics or running or high-intensity training, all these sort of fads come through. And people go, I'm going to go with that, I'm going to go do it. If it doesn't suit you, you won't keep it up. Mm -hmm. And the latest research that I've seen and been looking at this basically says the best exercise is the exercise that works for you. Again, mm, you, know, do, right? you know your own self, you know your own body. So whatever makes you be able to move regularly, that's what works. If yeah. it's going for a walk, if it's doing yoga, if it's going to the gym for four hours, it, right. it doesn't matter. What matters is that you find what works for you, what you can sustain. Well, I think also we, we used to have lifestyles, right, that, that necessitated exercise. If I was a farmer and didn't live in the city, then I was out all day walking behind a plow or weeding the fields or whatever it was, herding the sheep or the cattle. We don't typically have those jobs anymore. Most of us don't. And so we're now sitting sometimes eight plus hours a day and that is leading to significant yeah. challenges in our physiology, right? So maybe finding ways in which we can incorporate movement into our life is great, right? Well, so. 
people have even described the sedentary lifestyle as like the new smoking, right? That, that people, everybody knows that this is harmful for us, right? Mm -hmm. But it's now, how do we push back against right. it? What are some easy things we can do to push back on yeah. it? And the sitting at the new smoking is a, is a good word because we have so many different muscle types in our body. And if we are sitting, we, um, we, we don't train our muscles, we all know as, as our muscles, but we also don't train our digestion. So if we are sitting the whole day, then it's also difficult um, to, uh, to, um, yeah, to work with all the food we eat. And also our heart, heart, we forget our heart. Our heart is also a muscle. We have only one heart. And if our heart is beating and we train it, beating with because of good things, then our heart will be work also longer like our our uh, other body muscles. Yeah. So there really isn't any way of, of avoiding the fact the last three years or so have been tough on a lot of us around the world, right? We've had some pretty significant challenges that, <laughs> that we've dealt with. Um, so Fernando, can you suggest some top tips in the next category, which is rest and manage stress? What are your maybe top five suggestions in that category of rest and manage stress? First of all, I think you need to know the importance of resting. Mm -hmm. So sleeping and just rest at home for a while. Uh, of course, doing your physical activity, your 150 minutes a week to improve your heart rate, or your breathing, but it's important for you to rest, uh, especially with, um, with jobs that requires a lot of physical work, but also mental work you need to just rest, have a good sleep hygiene. So uh, sometimes people struggle to how to sleep. Uh, they cannot sleep, they have um, those issues, but you need to make an effort. So try to do simple things like, and try to choose what is best for you. Uh, try to not take caffeine some hours. Um, People sometimes like, for instance, I like to, to take a coffee before I sleep, and I sleep really well. Mm -hmm. But it's a paradox, and that's happened in, right. in physiology. Others may find, though, that if they do the same thing, yeah. even six to eight hours before sleep, it's going to disrupt their, yeah. their sleep Make and have some challenges exercise. with them. Right? Go take a walk after dinner, read a book. Mm -hmm. So if you have those, um, those routines, it's important to have a, a routine. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes it's not possible for me as a doctor that works in an ER. I have two nights a week that I don't sleep at home. Mm -hmm. And some, so I have, but my body is used to that, even if I know it's not healthy for me, but my body has struggled and now have new mechanisms to balance that. Mm -hmm. So it's important for people to really know how that works for them. Yeah. So have this process to how to sleep and then rest as much as they can. And do uh, some activities that help them, give them some, some pleasure, enjoyable things, that they feel good, emotionally balanced. That help, helps too. Because mm -hmm. stress sometimes is good. Right, it's motivating so, times, right. So when you have a task, when you have a lecture, when you have a project to do, you need to have some level of stress, and mm -hmm. that's good. Mm -hmm. uh, it's hard. It, it really uh, put the, the enough blood into your into your brain. It helps you to uh, be more sharp. But when it's too much, mm -hmm. it will make harm you. Yeah. So our systems weren't made to really uh, deal with stress all the time, all the right? Time. Yeah. Physiologically, we were talking about development. When, when a tiger would jump out of the jungle or a bear out of the woods, our body was meant to respond in a way yeah. that would allow us to, to escape that mm -hmm. life-threatening challenge. But when someone cuts us off on the road, our body responds in exactly the same way. Yeah. And if it's doing that constantly, 
it, it wreaks havoc on the system, right? Yeah, and that's because a lot of hormones we have in our bodies, so adrenaline, no adrenaline, cortisol, they release us when we have stress, mm -hmm. and we need it. We need it that we can uh, yeah, run fast, right. <laughs> yeah. or we need it that we can push hard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so fight or flight, yeah. or, and survival of the fittest. Yeah. If we don't um, manage this stressy situation, then we don't have a resilience, and in the past we could die. Yeah. But um, today maybe a stressy situation, what can have a positive effect is maybe like the wedding of your best friend and you're the brightest mm -hmm. maid, so you have mm -hmm. a I've short never been the bridesmaid, good... but yes, I understand. <laughs> Always sorry. the bride. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> or the birth of a baby. Yeah. The birth of a baby, you have a short time, a, a lot of stress, and then you have a big release of endorphins mm -hmm. in the moment when you got your baby. Yeah. And um, also when you have, um, after a stressy time, something good, like the tears of your best right. friend at the wedding. Um, this is um, such a great feeling in you that all the work, what you did, all mm -hmm. the stress, what you had, it's worth it. Yeah. It was worth it. And this endorphins, yeah. they makes us better. They makes us good. But if we have these hormones the whole time in us, I mean the bad hormones, not mm -hmm. the big chocolate with the endorphins, mm -hmm. more the adrenaline, no adrenaline and the cortisol, it can also influence um, our blood vessels. Yeah. It can influence our mood. It can influence our concentration and it can influence our digestion. Yeah. Again. So yeah. again, yeah. 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 So I mean, again. It's, it's, it's beautifully and, built, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And it's also, like you said, Ruth, so individually. Yeah. Yeah. It's so individual how we are managing stress. Yeah. We like to think that all these things are separate, right? That, but they're not. That, no, no, no. But they're all interrelated <laughs> so much. The, the gut-brain axis, mm -hmm. more and more there's becoming research yeah. relating that. Yeah. Which yeah. is also linked to the immune system. Yeah. Which is immune when we're talking about the, the microbioma, yeah, yeah, yeah. more and more there are available exams to the practitioners to know about your microbioma. Yeah. I recently read an article that was telling yeah. us that, that sleeplessness, those that don't sleep well, actually mm -hmm. require 40% more insulin production to manage yeah, healthy see, yeah. blood sugar levels. Yeah. It's pretty significant, yeah. right? Yeah. I, I, I loved your example. I mean, that there are people out there who can't necessarily, because of their work commitments or because they do can't necessarily have you know, a regular habit that you have of getting to sleep. And I love the fact that it doesn't have to be that way. There is a way that we can find, you can find, you can use tools and there's some, you know, some really nice doTERRA tools that you yeah. can use to help you to substitute, to, to find a rhythm that suits your life, even if it involves two nights a week in a hospital or four nights a yeah. week in a... Yeah. But then you can rest after yeah. that. Yeah. 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 But just, it's the balance. You need yeah, to you find need to something know yourself. that really You need matters. to know what is available for yeah. you. And there's a way to, to yeah. get balance again, yeah. even with an unbalanced work life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And complicated, but and yeah. that touch also about the emotions. Emotions is also important yeah. in that all that that dynamics. So when you see all the physiological and emotion and psychological, everything is connected. Yeah, and yeah. ever interacts with each other. So, so Ruth, our next level is reducing synthetic exposure. Y your my, my your career. specialty, <laughs> right? Uh, where you've spent your career. Yeah. So, what does this layer involve, and why is this an important area to be aware of? Well, you know, um, I think what we've discovered that, that it's been a chemical era. You know, there yeah. have been so many fantastic new products out there that you know help to do things like cleaning our house, looking after our mm -hmm. garden. You know, agricultural products to help yeah. our crops grow with less nutrition. Let's not, yeah, right, let's right. not go down that mm, path. Yep. Um, there, 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 is, there are so many fantastic things there, but what we've discovered over in recent times um, is that there's a real buildup of chemical substances in our environment that our bodies have to cope with on a daily basis. Yeah. And, you know, it's becoming a bigger and bigger challenge. I think most of the big organizations, I could talk about the WHO, I could talk about EU in Europe mm -hmm. itself, have all started to signal concerns about the possible health impacts that come from air pollution, mm -hmm. you know, agricultural compounds, things that are in our environment that we're constantly being exposed to. Yeah. And anything that we can do two sides to reduce that exposure or to help to prepare our bodies to deal with it because let's face it there are some things we can deal with mm -hmm. but we around this table can 
sing about it to our heart's content, we can't solve the air pollution issue. <laughs> right. Like, just like they didn't it, put the five of us in charge of the world. That's not, that's probably not good. Yet, actually, not yet. But we're working <laughs> on it. Yeah. No, but, I mean yeah. governments are trying to do things. Organizations yeah. are trying to do things. But it's going to take time, you know, you can't just suddenly take these all out of the environment. Now, I'm not someone who would, you know, say that we have to be absolutely uh, rigid about exposure. I just mm -hmm. believe that you can you can reduce it in many different ways. I yeah. personally, you know, I like to make all my own cleaning stuff mm -hmm. in home. Mm -hmm. Everything that I, I very rarely buy stuff yeah. from the shops now, I make it all at home. And my mother keeps saying, I used to do that. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, it's all, we used right. to do these things. Yeah. And she knows all these, I keep discovering something and saying, Mom, did you know that vinegar takes state? Yeah, of course I did. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Um, we're, so we're kind of returning to those old ways, we are, right? And it's, it's lovely. It's yeah. lovely to do it. But I think it all helps. It all helps yeah. to, you know, reduce our over, the overall burden that you're putting on your body. Yeah. Um, because your body has to deal with this as well as all the other stresses is concerned um, and all the normal bodily processes. And if you charge it with too much stuff, it will not be able to manage it properly. Yeah. It's, it's interesting, a lot of these are coming with personal care products, right? So yeah. the, the statistics I recently read is that, that uh, women use uh, 65 personal care products a day, which yeah. didn't surprise me a whole lot. But with those uh, personal care products, they had 160 synthetic chemicals yes. that they were putting on their skin that we know can create challenges. Yeah. And some of those chemicals actually we accumulate over time. That's, that's, that's what they're finding more the and more now. And, and actually even, you know, the, the, there are things that are out there that we, that we can't do anything about or are not like to do anything about. Right. I'm talking about, you know, the foods. I read just recently EFSA, which is the European Food Safety Authority, mm -hmm. um, have just published a report on bisphenol A, which, you know, we've all mm -hmm. heard a lot about over the years, and they've just determined that actually it is causing harm to people. Mm -hmm. And it's in pretty much everything, in the right. packaging, and it gets into our food. So, you know, there's a whole... They, they've just reduced the levels by 20,000. Wow. Wow. You know, so these we're finding more and more of these things out, and we need to help our bodies to deal with this. Yeah. With this stuff. And thankfully, now there's more and more products out there that are telling you right on the label, yes. yeah. right? BPA free being one of those. That's a hallmark of oh, I'm going to choose this yeah. over something else. We, yeah, we really. Yeah, I think reading labels is a very good habit to get into. Yes, yes. for sure. Yeah. And and recognizing maybe some of those yeah. compounds so that we can start making choices to avoid them. By that then we change who's yes. willing to produce them because that, if we're not spending say, the money on those things. We may not be able to change it immediately, but you, you know, you, if you put the pressure on people to do that, yeah. then it will happen. More and more you have more people awareness. Yeah. Yes. So there's a lot of products that are get out from the products, mm -hmm. that are reduced it or eliminated for the products, but there are many uh, substances that still are in our everyday products. Mm -hmm. yeah. That we use it, we eat it, we drink it. So more and more people are aware and read those, those labels that's true. and just make other choices. And that's important for uh, people like us that know the science and read uh, the, the studies to aware others to just make safety choices. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I, I completely agree with you, but I also, and I, I also think it's important to sort of keep passing that message across because it's a very confusing world out there. I mean, mm -hmm. the food labeling is a case in point. It can be very different from one place to another, and it, it can be overwhelming. <laughs> Again, go to, going back to the stress, you know, if you've not got much time and you're walking around a shop, how much time do you have to sort of pick off every packet and look at the label and think about right. it? it? It takes time. So I think the other thing, the other side of this is, yes, do it a little bit by little when, when you yeah. can reduce it. Yeah. But also prepare your body. Take those supplements, take those micronutrients, because the better prepared your body is, the more likely it is to be able to cope with the exposures that it, it can't avoid. Yeah, I love that concept, because we, we are going to be exposed to synthetics. Yeah. Uh, we just are, even as cleanly as we'd like to live. It's, it's a fact of life yes. in today's modern world, and so therefore yeah. I agree with that. We do what you can to reduce the amount of exposure in your life, 
and then you do what you can to prepare yourselves yeah, to deal with the exposure that you do have. And that involves that. that involves the nutritional level, that involves yeah. reducing your stress, that involves your rest, right. it involves exercise, you Supporting know, all our liver and our kidneys, right? Yeah, well, exactly, right. yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a great concept. So so as with rest and managed stress, the next layer is incredibly important. Um, and it, and it probably needs to be a priority now more than ever. So Alexandra, what can you tell us about implementing the idea of informed self-care effectively? Yeah, that's really exciting. We already talked about a little bit about this theme. Um, I think we have to make a difference between the self-care and the informed self-care. Mm -hmm. The self-care is to uh, promoting and improving your health. But in the informed self-care, care, you have to know how. And I think this is really important. So I think all the people who are looking now uh, in our video, uh, they doing the right thing. They, <laughs> they informed Getting informed, that's great. Because yes. they got now the information from us, maybe how can they live healthier. So the people, they, um, they, they have to search. They have to uh, think about how can I um, promote my health uh, better. And... Um, I think that a lot of people don't know how. A lot of people, like uh, Fernando said, they open the labels and they don't know me either. What is this word and what does this mean for us mm -hmm. or for me? And also how these things belongs together. And we see today how these things belongs together. So um, I think at first, yes, the people, they can inform themselves. And I, ha I think we have a lot of awareness advocates outside who are already doing this for all the people outside and themselves and for the other people who are don't doing this, who also would like to live healthier, um, they have to help them and they mm. already do it now. And that's so wonderful that we can be part of this um, yeah, informed self-care on a maybe a little more special or scientific way uh, where they can get the uh, information. Yeah, I, I like that's... what this implies too, the, the self-care, right? We need to feel empowered and responsible that's to a, look after our own health and wellness and then to help others. That's such a good mm -hmm. point. I think your own yeah. personal responsibility to your mm -hmm. self-care is a really important aspect yeah. there. Yeah. I completely agree. I agree. I, th I think that th that's the beauty of the Scientific and Medical Education Committee is that's really a place where we can be of most assistance is saying, look, we, we're understanding more and more about how to use products to care for ourselves and our bodies and our environment. and and we'd like to share that information. So it gives us the opportunity to do what we're all passionate about, which is helping people, right? We went into this business, we went into this, our education, that long, arduous process so that we can then be of assistance to other people. That's and right. it's the beauty of the Scientific Medical Education Committee is that we get to do that with some natural products, which are so amazing. Yes. So on top of that, we have proactive health care. Proactive health care is really that space in which People interact with, particularly us as physicians, right? Um, looking for how do we uh, how do we move forward with with our health? I would say that one of the things that that maybe our wellness advocates need to know is to understand their own risk, right? Um, we might look at family history or genetics to understand what am I particularly at risk for? You were mentioned earlier, kind of specified things that that we can know about ourselves, like continuous glucose monitors, those sorts of things. But when we look at our own family history, it tells us some things that we might be at risk for, right? Um, and, and some things that we might want to do about that, participating in screenings at appropriate time, getting uh, annual labs done to know where I sit, and, and not just one time, but also over time to see, is this changing, right? Um, we, we look at glucose and maybe an A1C and realizing that, yes, it might be a normal range, but the last three years you've trended up. And so if we continue this for the next three years, this is where you're going to end up. So let's do some things now to change that. Um, what do you find with, with, in, with this health care portion of things, proactive health care? What would you wish to tell your patients to do in that proactive health care space? Oh, I think... First, I need to give him the responsibility. So, is your life? I'm here to love that. To, is your life? But I'm here to help you, to love support that. you. I'm going to give you my hand to go with you along the way. Yeah. You will not be alone. And let's see the family history. Yeah. Let's see how is your past. So let's see what is your current problems. Mm -hmm. What is the future problem that could happen? Right. So 
let's make some changes if you need so. Yeah. And if I'm here to answer all your questions. Yeah. So be, uh, uh, as a physician, available for them and also because some of them are families that take care of the kids right. and they're older. So they need to know there is not, there's a person that take care of yourself but take care of others. Yeah. So re they really need to know about a proactive care. I love that, Fernando, because for me, I term it, don't ever give away your power, which means that you, you as an individual should be in charge of your health care. And sometimes we have people that interact with the medical system and they come in and say, well, I'm just here to do whatever you tell me. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't think that's a healthy relationship. It really should be a, I'm a physician, I'm here to counsel with you and advise you, but at the end of the day, this is your decision, 100% mm -hmm. your decision as to whether or not you, you take those recommendations and make those changes mm -hmm. or, or not. And, and if we can keep that relationship a healthy one of you're in control as the patient, I'm simply here to counsel with you and advise you, then that's probably a healthier relationship yeah, than what we do. That's what I do when I buy patients. Yeah. Uh, when I propose them a program, I ask them, do you agree with me? Yeah. I was settled. Yeah. Like making a contract. Yeah. So this is what I propose. Yeah. So we can negotiate, of yeah. course, but this is your life. That's you can do yeah. it. Because we are in a world with a lot of information. Mm -hmm. Like you said, we have a media, we have you have the information that we never had, yeah. our patterns never had. Yeah. Even us, when we study, we need to go to libraries, see books, and now they just, in a click, they can see yeah. thousands and thousands of books. So yeah. they come to our offices and make questions, and we are there to just answer them, yeah. to uh, just give them the real information behind all the, some information that you can read on yeah. online. The other concept that I like within this space is meeting the patient where they are, meeting the individual where they are, making sure that we're not asking them to go a mile when they're only able to walk, you know, 15 yards or, or uh, you know, half a kilometer, right? We need to make sure that we're asking what is the next step that they can make in their healthcare choices and, and their lifestyle, not what is the ultimate yeah. that we want them to get to. Proactively. Right? Yeah, proactively, right? Yeah. So if we can help them make those small incremental changes in their life, uh, then they're likely to be able to respond easier and be able to accomplish those things. Imagine so. a person with eight years old that has problems with, what, with endocrine problems mm -hmm. and they need to change, have some change in their habits. Mm -hmm. It's difficult to change uh, a diet with mm -hmm. a guy with yeah. eight years old. Yeah. It's complicated. Yeah. You can make mild changes, but it's the age of your grandfather. Yeah. So right. You cannot expect they make huge changes. Right. So we need yeah. to be flexible and just see the other side and try to be as more humble as possible to help them. Yeah. Well, I appreciate your, your having this conversation. It's been fun to be with you and, and talk about the wellness chart and how important that is for us to adopt in our own lives, right? Absolutely. Making sure we're paying attention to that. And then also for our amazing wellness advocates out there to understand why these things are so important. That there is real scientific backing to each level of the wellness chart. And, uh, and that they're making those lifestyle changes and, and changing their lives as well. So grateful for each of you and thank you for your time today.